Good morning, everyone. I suggest we start. Welcome to uh, this town hall number 74 at IGF 2023. Um, the topic of this meeting is internet fragmentation and uh, the technical community and uh, in the context of the GDC. Uh, we have uh, four speakers uh, today. Uh, so my name is David Abikasis. I'll be moderating uh, this session. I work with a company called Analysis Mason, and we uh, we do quite a bit of work in this space. Um, to my left, Danko Yekovic, uh, the vi vice chair of the ICANN board. Uh, to my right, Annelise Williams uh, from .au, uh, and Bruna Martin Santos uh, from uh, Digital Action. Uh, and online, we have Michael Kendi, who's my colleague from Analysis Mason, and uh, also works independently on a lot of these topics. Uh, the, the idea in this meeting, I know there's quite a lot of scheduling conflicts, so it's a few of us, but hopefully we can make it interactive and informative. Uh, please don't hesitate to come and sit around the table if you'd like to, uh, if you'd like to speak uh, during the session. Um, what we will do is uh, uh, have uh, ev each one of the speaker spend about four or five minutes setting the scenes on the, in their own areas. And then we'll open the floor to, to questions and discussions. And hopefully it can be interactive. and We can, uh, we can agree or disagree uh, in a constructive manner. Um, so perhaps just to, uh, j just to set the scene very, very briefly, um, we, we've been talking about fragmentation over the last couple of days. Uh, there, was a, there were a number of meetings and town halls and workshops uh, uh, yesterday. I think Jean was on in one yesterday. Uh, and one of the questions that, uh, that, that came up is uh, the types of fragmentation. And today we want to talk about uh, the role of the technical community, um, but we can't abstract this from the various types of fragmentation that we've been talking about. Uh, the internet was built effectively from the start as a way to ensure that separate and fragmented networks uh, could, uh, could work together, could communicate. Uh, and the main objective in uh, the, the origins of the internet was resilience and uh, scalability, versatility uh, ended up very much at, as, as a sort of side effects of that resilience. Uh, but that's what makes the, the value of the internet today. Um, so the fragmentation of networks was an issue from the start uh, and it was necessary to, defi to, to, to define unified protocols, shared technical resource management, uh, and to some extent a degree of shared governance to ensure that the internet worked. Um, there have been uh, examples where uh, there's been attempts to unify uh, networks, uh, network protocols further. Uh, under, for example, the Network 2030 initiative of the ITU, there were some proposals for a new IP uh, framework that would really fundamentally change the way uh, the network protocols work. Um, and, and that did not work, I think it's fair to say, and we can explore why it fits of interest to, to people in this panel. Um, so it's important not to talk about fragmentation in the abstract, but in the context of specific aspects of the internet, including this middle layer of technical resources and technical standards, uh, and in the context of specific policy objectives. Um, the link with the Global Digital Compact, I think, is, is really there in terms of the, the link with the, the policy objectives that we want to, to pursue. Uh, and uh, the questions that, we want to, that I want to ask today are, what, what is the role of the technical community um, as sort of unified in some ways and fragmented in other ways that we can see today uh, in pursuing those roles and in responding to the policy objectives set out uh, in the GDC and more broadly by policymakers and governments uh, and how governments and the technical community can, uh, can talk together in a more effective way is, is also a theme that we want to address. Um, so I'll stop there uh, and I'll hand over to Michael Kendi uh, for a retrospective of uh, how we got here. Michael. Great. Well, good morning from Geneva. Um, glad to be here, at least virtually. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Great. So, um, as David said, the purpose of this town hall is to identify how the technical community can best represent itself within the, the UN uh, Global Digital Compact process on the topic of avoiding technical fragmentation. And that's broadened out a bit, as I'll explain in a minute, to um, more broadly, the role of the technical community within internet governance in general. 
Um, so I'll just give a brief background on the GDC, the Global Digital Compact process and the role of the technical community. Um, after a few years of discussions and reports on digital cooperation, the idea for the, the compact was proposed by, by the UN Secretary General in 2021 in a report called Our Common Agenda as a way to outline, quote, outline shared principles for an open, free, and secure digital future for all. And according to the report, uh, the compact could cover a number of uh, topics, um, including uh, connecting the unconnected, uh, data governance, uh, human rights online, artificial intelligence, and specifically avoiding fragmentation of the internet. And sometimes it's kind of hard to get a handle on what is actually meant by, um, by what is the global digital compact going to be. Um, and I think that's still to be resolved, but a, a good quote that I found um, kind of explaining it comes from the, uh, the Geneva internet platform saying, quote, that the GDC is the latest step in a lengthy process, policy journey to have at the very least a shared understanding of key digital principles globally and at most common rules that will guide the development of our digital future along the lines of the topics that I just mentioned. And the, the, the goal is to have this global digital compact agreed um, a, just under a year from now at the summit of the future in September 2024 in uh, New York at the General Assembly meetings. Uh, as a way of gathering information, there were a number of consultations um, many people submitted uh, to um, uh, their, their views on the various topics into the consultation. And then the two countries that are co-facilitating the, uh, the development of the compact are Sweden and Rwanda, and they organized a number of thematic deep dives uh, earlier this year in the spring on eight of the topics. Uh, including connectivity, data protection, et cetera, and slightly shifted from avoiding fragmentation of the internet to more broadly internet governance. Um, but among the questions that were asked, it was definitely still in relation to fragmentation. The questions to be raised during the deep dive included how to ensure an unfragmented internet, how to make sure it's interoperable, and specifically the role of ICANN, IETF, and the IGF in supporting internet governance. So even if internet fragmentation may not be explicit anymore, the role of the technical community um, still is, is going to be addressed and should be addressed. And this definition of multi-stakeholder um, governance was developed and adopted uh, actually starting here in Geneva in 2003 and then in the Tunis agenda of 2005 at the World Summit on the Information Society which itself was an intergovernmental meeting that allowed input from stakeholders, including the academic community, technical community, civil society, and, and the private sector. And the technical community was specifically highlighted uh, as a stakeholder, contributing to the work of government, private sector, and civil society. Um, but recently a blog came out by the heads of ICANN, uh, APNIC, and Aaron, um, that kind of started to say maybe that there's a new tripartite view to view of digital cooperation where the, the three players are the private sector, government and civil society, and that the technical community is subsumed within civil society, which was not the case before and arguably um, is, is not relevant or, or should not be the case now. And I'll drop the link to that into the chat for those of you who, who have access to it. Um, but the question that I think we wanted to raise in this, in this session was, um, do, under, do governments really understand the role of the technical community? How can one best get it across? How should the technical community ensure that there's a role in the negotiations that are coming up um, later this year and in the spring? How to ensure a role in the summit of the future and to ensure a, a role in the global digital compact itself? So I'll leave it there with those questions. I look forward to, um, to the discussion that will follow. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Um, I'll pass it on to Danko for a few remarks on, uh, I guess, both the role of ICANN in that, uh, in that uh, space 
And Michael raised the question of whether the technical community should be a, a more unified stakeholder uh, in the multi-stakeholder model. Uh, so if you have any thoughts on that. Thank you. OK, we can hear that. So uh, well, when we, a lot has been said in your introductions, and I think uh, I, I agree with that. But let's just try to take one step back when we discuss about the role of the technical community. And uh, sitting here at the uh, Internet Governance Forum, maybe we should sometimes ask ourselves, what is the Internet? And from the technical point of view, Internet is a network of networks, obviously, but something that is defined by the IETF developed protocols. So we have IPv4 and IPv6 overlaid over each other. And the Internet is defined by the IP addresses that are assigned by the regional Internet registry and by the BGP routing that is connecting those IP addresses. But also for the end user's point of view, uh, Internet is defined by the DNS system. It's defined by the root zone that is uh, managed by IANA. And the key to that, I think, is that uh, all, all of that actually depends on the trust of end users into the root server system in those 11 IP addresses that define the location of the root servers. So when we look at the fragmentation, I think we should ask ourselves what are we discussing about. So we are actually discussing this system of trust that is uh, rooted in the root server system and that, that is all that is defined. So it is important if we want to avoid the fragmentation to uh, continue to have the trust is in that system. And that system is the mid layer that is overlaid on the telecommunication networks and below the applications and the user content of users, but this mid layer is critical for the content. So I think I would agree that uh, in uh, fragmentation, we always had a different user experience in different countries. And for example, in order to get to, to the content of Facebook, you have to log on. If you want to uh, go to the website of a car manufacturer, usually you go to something.com and that translates you to your, uh, moves you to your local country code, the main name where you see content in your own language. So you have different experiences in different countries, but in my mind, this is not the fragmentation because the mid-technical layer is still there and still functions. So I would say that today internet is not fragmented in that sense, and I would say that we are fine. But going into uh, discussions about uh, Global Digital Compact, we have to uh, think how we will protect this middle layer in this inter interoperability that is built on that trust in the whole system and, and the root service. And this brings us back to this discussion, what is the role of the technical community and how, especially in the UN environment, it is basically uh, multilateral uh, and uh, the Global Digital Compact will be uh, contract of countries, how to best to have the role of the technical community. And I think it is very important that it is uh, well-defined and that it is a keeper of the future freedom of these uh, open protocols and interoperability and, uh, and uh, how to say it, a basis for the trust in the system. Thank you, Danko. Uh, you made a very important point here around the fact that um, fragmentation and diversity uh, don't need to be in opposition to one another and actually can, can complement each other. So if we avoid fragmentation at the right level, we will keep diversity uh, where it matters. And perhaps, uh, Bruna, if I can hand over to you to talk a little bit about the work that you're doing with the policy network on internet fragmentation and also the perspective of the civil society, perhaps you can take a view on whether or not the technical community should be part of civil society or not? <laughs> deep, deep and, and pr like hard question, right? But starting with the PNIF, um, Policy Network on Internet Fragmentation is one of the intersessional work for the IGF currently, right? We are just in our second year. Um, and we started with this perception that um, it was very often that 
some of the discussions about internet fragmentation went to a rather technical discussion or even excluding at times because it would be debates um, surrounding basically the technical layers or the technical aspects and then a lot of people perceptions questions um, about what happened to the user experience were kind of left in the middle of the way so if you spoke with um, the folks that I can I can community they would um, maybe mention and bring some of the things that Dunko just brought up about like DNS or whether like managing IP numbers um, that would be related to this um, if they failed it would be related to fragmentation but when you speak to civil society or even activists some people very often brought up cases like internet shutdowns as examples so what we did um, in the PNIF in the end of the day was to divide this debate in three baskets the first one being um, the technical um, fragmentation of the technical layer, so classical discussions on, on this space. Um, second one would be the fragmentation of the user experience, so the interventions um, that might occur to the, to the net or to the user experience in, in the general way, and that would affect um, their own perception or their own experience, um, like shutdowns or even like court orders in asking for content to be geo-blocked or even um, blocking of applications on the internet. These are some of the examples we bring up. And the last one is the one that relates to the GDC, that is the fragmentation of internet governance and coordination. And it goes, um, it starts with an analysis that a lot of these forums that we have been engaging and discussing, they stopped to communicate with each other at some point. And the GDC process was the most concerning one because um, it is placed from a member state's perspective, but it felt like something that would go along the lines of the IGF because at the very beginning of this process, it did discuss the IGF plus and how we would improve this space, right? But at some point, these discussions were dropped from it. And then um, recently, we had the suggestion of the Digital Cooperation Forum so what the PNIF um, does within this discussion is to say we should avoid duplication, we should um, make sure people have the time and the space and the knowledge to engage in these spaces. And last but not least, um, all of the digital cooperation discussions and governance, they should be leveraging from the IGF's um, collective intelligence. So that is a little bit of some of the things we have been discussing. and. Um, on the discussion paper the PNIF just put out, um, they do highlight some concerns about the Digital Cooperation Forum that was suggested within one of the policy briefs, mostly because um, it will be yet another expens expensive and excluding process. Um, it's not everybody that gets to go to New York, it's not everybody that knows how to navigate UNGA or something like that. And to know that um, just now the Tech Envoy mentioned that civil society or any other stakeholders should engage with member states, should be part of the delegations, is something that hints, right, that multi-stakeholderism might not be a tool in that way. And it's indeed in, like concerning if um, the GDC continues to touch upon like a lot of the topics and discussions we have here. So I think um, just to say that and about the like technical community, civil society, I do think it's a misunderstanding to be honest, like, or it might be just um, from a very kind of um, policymaker perspective that doesn't really dive into the multi-stakeholderism debate and divisions that we did in the WISIS and the Tunis process, right? So they look, they might look at all of us as civil society in the broader way, but they, um, but when we put everybody in the same box, we miss a lot of the relevant discussions, right? Like a lot of the activism, a lot of the problems that each of our like spaces can discuss. So I do think that um, bundling everybody up might be a little bit problematic, but I'll stop there. Thank you, Bruna. So there's a couple of things that you've just said that uh, I think resonate and that uh, hopefully Annelies can comment on as well. I think one is the fact that some of the discussions can be overly technical and excluding. So obviously your, I guess your point, your, your perspective is from the perspective of civil society but uh, can it be excluding also for government stakeholders that may not have the expertise? Uh, and that resonates in your last comment around uh, the misunderstanding that you highlight. Now, I think perhaps one thing that we can discuss around this table is the extent to which the technical community can make its own fate uh, from that perspective by uh, maybe putting together a, a more unified or a more coordinated front 
um, to, to be more visible to policymakers. And do you want to say a few words from your perspective as a member of the technical community, but also as a former government official? Thanks, David. Um, my name is Annalise Williams. I, um, I'm with the .au Domain Administration, Australia's CCTLD. Uh, and as David has uh, just referred to, I am relatively new to the technical community. Uh, I've been with ALDA for about two and a half years, but before that, for about 14 years, I was with the Australian government, uh, including um, as ICANN's, uh, Australia's representative in ICANN's Governmental Advisory Committee and Australia's representative to the ITU. Uh, so I have been involved in these um, discussions for quite some time on a, from a government perspective and um, it, is, it is wonderful to be here today to, to be at the um, Internet Governance Forum and I did want to just really make the, the point uh, that, you know, as, as wonderful it is, as it is to come to these multi-stakeholder meetings, they're very interesting. The, the point of the multi-stakeholder um, governance system itself is because um, preserving the open, free, secure and globally in interoperable internet is best done uh, when we have all of the relevant stakeholders as participating in part of the d in the discussions and the decision making processes. Um, so the, the, the Global Digital Compact is an intergovernmental process. Uh, it, it doesn't necessarily have a seat at the table for the technical stakeholders. So I would, um, you know, my, my, you know, challenge, I guess, to the technical community is to involve yourselves in these conversations. Um, it, there is a, a, a tendency I have observed over the years of, among many stakeholder, technical stakeholders to sort of say, well, consider the technical and the policy issues to be separate. Uh, but then they're, they're not separate. They are very um, closely linked, and there does need to be more engagement between the the policy stakeholders and the the technical stakeholders. Um, as David has just said, uh, engaging with governments and helping them to understand the the technical aspects of policy issues or the the, the technical implications of potential policy issues is a really important um, role that the technical community can play. Um, I, I think it is important that we do engage as a technical community. Um, we need to lean into the conversation, um, engage with governments, listen to their concerns, and instead of just saying, that's not my problem, you know, it, it is our problem. It is, it's everybody's problem to, to get together and have these conversations collectively. Um, it, you know, it's, it's everybody's business to get engaged. Um, the technical community is uniquely placed to be involved in these conversations. We, you know, there is significant expertise in the technical community. Um, and you know, my view is that the technical community needs to step up and lean into these conversations or there is a risk that, um, you know, as a, as a distinct stakeholder group, it, it, th that voice will be lost. And um, I, I think, uh, you know, Bruno alluded to it before, but the Secretary General uh, yesterday in his speech sort of referred to the business community, um, the civil society and governments uh, in relation to the, uh, the, the, the Global Digital Compact, but there was no mention of the technical community. Uh, and I, I think... You know, it is important to get engaged and it, it's not enough to just sort of sit on the sidelines and let somebody else do the discussions. Um, yeah, yeah. My, my request and my invitation to the technical stakeholders is to lean in and engage with governments in these discussions. Thanks, David. Thank you, Annelise. So we're about the halfway mark. So what I would suggest we do is to open the floor to questions, discussions, recommendations. Uh, I would uh, sort of ask all of you to not hesitate to put forward strong views. Um, Jean? Hi, thank you. Jean-François from the AI Foundation for the record. Um, so I got a few questions here that I would like to, to look into. I, I don't know exactly who will be willing to, to answer, and I don't know if we have the answers in the room. But um, So why are they asking this change specifically to the technical community? That's something that is kind of surprising me. Um, and how are they justifying that particular uh, change? Which other communities have been merged in this same fashion? Has in any other community uh, been requested to be merged with a civil society or with any other thing? Um, who has been consulted for this decision? 
and what is the technical community going to do to avoid being removed from the equation? Who wants to take this hand, please? Do you want to? Um, Brian? Let's just step in on some of the aspects. I think the exclusion comes from the perspective, right? Um, if the GDC is going to be moving forward as a solely intergovernmental um, process, then everything that's not governmental is going to be bundled up, right? And that's why um, the tech envoy has just said right now that we should be asking for inclusion within delegations. So I think they're, they're mostly basic, like looking at everybody in the same way. I, I, I don't understand whether, I know that there was one statement from him that was um, rather critical on the engagement of technical community and so on. And that's also why um, on the civil society gathering we had this week, um, we had a more or less of a general consensus in the room that none of this conversation should be moving forward without the technical community as well, because um, otherwise it would lose some of the aspects. But I just wanted to maybe weigh in on that. I think it's mostly from the perspective of the intergovernmental and anything that's not there um, should be left. Correct, correct me if I'm wrong. I, from my memory, the statement was mentioned about a new tripartite model by which we have governments, corporate, and civil society. And so all of a sudden, corporations are not government. So it's not only governmental but the only ones that seem to be merged somewhere is a technical community. So I'm very curious about why that particular move and under which circumstances and who has been consulted prior to that, if anyone. I can uh, answer a bit of that, David. Yes, go ahead, Michael, sorry. So I think some of it might just be historic. I mean, if you, hi, Constantinos. <laughs> Um, some of it may be historical um, that the original definition of um, multi-stakeholder governance, the one that's always quoted, talks about uh, the development and application by governments, the private sector, and civil society in their respective roles um, of shared principles, etc. So the technical community was never mentioned specifically there. It's the same three that are being talked about now. But then if you, if you dig into the Tunis agenda and everything, the technical community is discussed specifically. The other one I think that's not mentioned now is the academic community, um, which I don't think even is mentioned um, at all. So some of it may just be historical, just taking the same three, but I think that just highlights all the more the need for the technical community for everyone to, to be specific and, 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 and ensure a specific role so that it just doesn't get subsumed out of kind of historical, I don't wanna say laziness, but just looking back at the, the over, overview definition and not what went behind it. And I think that was, the, I, I put that blog in the, um, in the chat if, if you have access to it, but I think that's really important that, that people delve into the history a little bit and make sure that everyone knows that the technical community was represented from the beginning. Thanks, Michael. Anis, did you want to add something to this? No, same point. Thank you very much. Um, does somebody else want to, to weigh in, ask a question? Don't be shy. Go ahead. Yes. Good morning. My name is Peter Koch. I work for DINIC, the German top-level domain registry, undoubtedly technical community. And I would respectfully suggest that we are allowing to have, uh, to, to be forced into a wrong discussion here. Um, I did hear uh, the SecGen mention the technical community explicitly, obviously in response to some concerns that were raised in, again, response to a statement made by the ambassador at the Eurodic meeting, already later corrected or amended at his appearance at the um, Caribbean uh, IGF, if I recall correctly. So I would not suggest that this is all not necessary or not important. But I do think instead of investing energy in the forensics of these events, we might do ourselves and everybody else, because we are important, we might do ourselves a favor into uh, in looking into 
better explaining what the importance and the contribution of the technical community is, which also might include the question, who is the te technical community actually, given that the internet governance is evolving into digital, so that might include others, and of course all the quote quote boundaries between these different stakeholder group, none of these are very, very sharp or very thin, right? It's always floating. Um, so instead having the forensics going on, uh, what is the contribution? And I do think that the contribution today is probably more important than 20 years ago when it was all about names and numbers and so on and so forth, which still is important, but we see more and more regulation coming up and more and more demands for regulation that completely lose out of sight these unintended side effects that the technical community is probably well prepared to identify and explain. The further away we go from that technical layer, the more tempting the regulation appears to be these days, but um, the more unintended the side, side effects might be. And that's something that I suggest we focus on. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Um, does someone want, maybe Danko, or does someone want to weigh in on, I guess, these two questions? Who is the technical community and how should it engage? Which are the points that Peter raised? Please. Okay, I have a bit of comment on that. So first on the well, forensics, UN Secretary General, in his opening speech, he mentioned technical community, but part of the of the IGF and VCIS process. And later on, when he speak about Global Digital Compact, it was a different stakeholder group. So in a way, for me, that was a kind of message. And I think this is important why we want to emphasize the importance of the technical community. Obviously, to because... Uh, uh, we should not talk about the model, we should talk about the success of internet that was brought by this open standard and everything. But uh, I think the key, as you said, are the consequences. So we in the technical community often, um, we don't make legislation, we have to ob observe the regulations of any country, but we are there to discuss with the countries and to Help, help them understand the consequences of a, a possible policy discussions. So for example, in the ICANN there is obviously government advisory committee and also we have a global stakeholder engagement and government engagement in trying to, to do all those things. But uh, looking back uh, on, on those discussions and how the things will turn out, I think it's not, it's not very, um, logical that, uh, so there is a risk that the, um, things might turn out in a way that some of the concerns of the technical community in future will not be fully taken in account. And on your question where it is coming from, I don't think it's kind of a decision that was made by someone. I think it's a trend that is also resulting of, the, uh, of this, what is happening on the internet now. Uh, so I was sitting uh, as a MAG member for three years, a couple of years ago, and most of the discussions are not anymore about the names and numbers that seems to be kind of solved layer, but most of the discussions are about the content, uh, the, the, the abuses in the internet, uh, uh, negative consequences, crime, hate speech, and all that. And uh, importance of the of the technical community names and numbers going back is that that uh, mid layer is very convenient for some of the uh, possible regulation to find a, a magical key that will solve the content problem and we understand that that magical key actually does not work and can create uh, all sorts of different problems so i think this is the reason why we are trying to use this uh, also igf to bring uh, back this discussion about uh, possible fragmentation and the roles that must be there to avoid, uh, I think, uh, uh, trying to quote Vint, uh, to avoid uh, that internet might end up uh, where we deserve it to be. Thank you, Danko. Uh, Andy, do you want to? Did you want to come in um, on this? No. Yeah, just to echo that.
just to echo that, I don't, and what Peter said, I don't think it was a, a deliberate decision. Um, and, you know, I think Peter is absolutely right. We need to be having some conversations about what it is that the technical community can contribute to these conversations. Um, and also, you know, who, who is the technical community these days? I think the, the internet and the use of the internet and our reliance on the internet has changed significantly since the Tunis agenda was written and the, the, you know, the, the roles and definitions of stakeholders was, um, you know, enshrined in those early documents. Thank you. I mean, it seems to me that one of the outcomes that's possible from that to, to kind of maybe square what the two of you said and what Danko just said uh, is that the, the technical community becomes just subsumed under the corporate uh, side of things, also because corporations are the entities that are most easily regulated. Uh, and so, you know, is that, is that something that's desirable or not? Uh, I don't know, perhaps that's a question too. <laughs> You're shaking your head. <laughs> Does somebody else want to? Bruna, do you want to come? Can you talk about the inclusion of corporations? It's okay. <laughs> Just about the inclusion of corporations in the whole thing. There is one part that will come at some point that is um, member states, the UN, needing to ensure the buy-in from companies. Um, Summit of the future, um, the Summit of the future is a broader process, right? It's not just the GDC. It will also entail some discussions on a code of conduct for information integrity. And that um, touches upon a lot of these corporations, right? So that will talk about like, social media companies, we'll talk about some other like content related um, corporations as well. So I, I think that by um, addressing them from the very beginning might be an initial attempt to get some level of a buy-in from these um, stakeholders in general. But at the same time, like I, um, as civil society, like we have been very critical of the whole process in general. And um, I think a lot of this conversation, both the technical community and civil society one, is kind of this shared um, consensus about some level of frustration for abandoning the multi-stakeholder model along the way um, in a process that, process that started with this promise of um, improving the IGF, rediscussing the spaces and rediscussing participation. So just to, to add this to the conversation as well. Thank you, Bruno. Um, perhaps just behind you, uh, yeah, there was a question there. If you can say who you are, just briefly. Is that better? Yes. Okay. Good morning. Oh, we are morning still, yes. Uh, David Fairchild from the Canadian Mission in Geneva. Um, I jumped in a bit late, but I think there's something that we wanted to convey, which is we, the foreign ministries, which is the demographics of who's doing the negotiating has changed significantly since 2005. And I think the challenge is, is that you, the people that you want to interact with are not the same people anymore. And it's a challenge that I think it's accelerating, but who in the technical community has actually met their foreign ministry counterparts um, to, in order to engage and educate? And we are running out of time. The GDC negotiations probably will begin shortly in the new year. We have two and a half months to prepare ourselves. There is no zero draft to work from as far as we understand. So it's an empty canvas, and I think the challenge is different member states are at different levels of cooperation and collaboration internally, but I think for many of the technical community, it's a new demographic that they're not used to talking to. And so I just put that out as a, a challenge that's, I think, on both sides of the floor. Um, it's a language we don't speak, so there's a lost in translation aspect to this. Uh, but it behooves us as policymakers to seek out the technical community but it also works the other way. I think that's just an important point I think I wanted to flag. Thank you, David. I think that's very similar to what Anne Lee said. Uh, so this uh, talking the same language, engaging productively. I mean, I guess one of the questions that we're grappling with is also who's doing that engaging, right? And, and, and how, you know, are they speaking from one voice? Are they speaking from many different voices? And how does that, how does that come across on the other side to, to those counterparts that you're describing? Yeah, I just wanted to make a, a reflection. I, I would like a bit of an opinion about this cognitive dissonance that I seem to observe quite often when it comes to technology, as if technologies would be something nebulous. Imagine that we're having this conversation in terms of healthcare, and we will have policies about how to manage healthcare, but we don't recognize that doctors are the ones who are going to be applying all of that, or that you have the same conversations about 
codes for building skyscrapers and you don't talk with the, with the architects and you just put them into, oh, civil society will talk for them or they will bundle them with corporates because they're the ones who are building the buildings. Uh, we are in this room because someone came up with the idea of building the internet and that was a technologist. And no matter the resolutions that we have in these rooms, in the end, when it comes to in, um, technical application and technical implementations, it's gonna come from a technologist as well. So if we keep talking to them in language that they don't understand, we don't talk to them in ways that they're gonna be able to implement, it, I don't see how we can remove them from the equation without considering having them in the room as an actual participant. It, it just, it, it doesn't compute to me, so maybe I'm missing something, if you, anyone can give me an argument about that. I, I don't think anybody here is suggesting that you know these conversations should be having happening without the technical community. This is kind of the, the purpose of this session: is how how can how can we engage in these processes? What have we got to say? What have we got to contribute? Um, so yeah, I, I don't think anybody here would argue that the technical community, the technical stakeholders, shouldn't be part of the conversation. But the fact is that these are intergovernmental processes, uh, and the, the best way of engaging is to engage with with governments and you know foster relationships and dialogues and you know help them to understand and for the technical community to to um, try and understand where, where they're coming from and what problems the governments are trying to solve. Um, I'm seeing Konstantinos wants to speak. Thanks, uh, yes, uh, very quickly on this. Sorry. You said it, you said exactly what I was about to say about the, the, the need to evolve the technical, technical community. I think the, the difference is how the technical community involves and what sort of message it conveys. And I think that this is what has, is different in many ways. Uh, you know, 20 and 30 years ago, governments were not really invested or knew any, a lot of things about the internet. We were all celebrating the internet because, you know, it, didn't, it, it hadn't been used yet as a weapon of any sort, whether it was misinformation or for um, cyber attacks or cyber... Whatever it was. So every, everyone was really behind it. There was little governmental interest, but right now we are at a place where governments, for better or worse, they are interested. And they are stakeholders. That's the whole part of the multi-stakeholder model, right? It's not, you know, no one leads necessarily in, in the multi-stakeholder model in, in, the, in the sense that what I am right, you know, what I'm saying needs to go because I happen to know better. That's not the way it works. So the technical community needs to be involved, but also the technical community, and I sort of leave aside what we mean by technical community for the time being, needs to understand that things have changed. And also, and it is important to provide a narrative that equips governments to, you know, to, to defend the internet rather than give them very abstract notions of openness and global reach and interoperability. No, you need to tell governments how they can achieve this. We have the infrastructure that supports these things, that infrastructure will always, always exist. The question is, how can we make, um, how can we use the, this infrastructure to its fullest potential? Thank you, Constantinos. Yes, go ahead. Question. Sorry, um, just to come back, um, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not sure of this gentleman's name, but I did want to just flag that um, Outer has recently published uh, an, an internet governance roadmap, which you can find on our website. Uh, and one of the uh, actions that we're calling for there is for greater cl collaboration among the technical stakeholders, the technical community, um, you know, to ensure better coordination amongst the existing internet institutions uh, and, you know, strengthen collaboration between the, the policy and the technical stakeholders. So I just wanted to draw your attention to that. Thank you, Annelies. Danko, you wanted to add something? Maybe Danko first and then Michael can, can go ahead. Okay. I just wanted to thank to both of you uh, on these comments. Uh, I think it is very true. Uh, and f speaking of ICANN, I think we, we got the message. So first of all, traditionally, of course, ICANN has the Government Advisory Committee and we uh, are working with uh, uh, country representatives. They, they advise 
I can board and the public policies, but we also have a lot of rotation there, so it's uh, it's continuous work. And we have a, a government engagement team that is also very much present here, so one of the f engagements we are doing here. But also, as we have a free, a large ICANN meetings throughout the world, uh, in June the next year, we will have a big meeting in uh, Africa and Rwanda that is not only for African region, but it's global. And in connection to that, we will have a high-level ministerial meeting. And one of the things that ICANN is doing is trying to engage the governments to send high-level representatives to that meeting. So I think we get the message and we are doing that. But also, very importantly, I think it's not only about ICANN. Uh, uh, ICANN is, has the resources to do those things, so that's why we're doing it. But it's also all the technical community coming together, uh, not only through the ICANN, but uh, through different things. And of course, with ISOC, with uh, country code registries, with the regional IP registries. And all together, we have to prepare ourselves for the uh, VCS uh, plus 20 review that will probably move the things uh, to be more sync with the importance of the current world. And as you said, the governments see the importance of the internet now. They see also negative consequences. Uh, they are very important with them. We have, for example, bilateral with the uh, UK minister who said that the uh, most important uh, uh, increase in crime is online so for the uk government it's important topic and of course ICANN is doing something we are very active in the dns abuse area our remit is quite narrow but we take the importance of all these messages and communicate with governments very strongly and i think this is something that um, shows the results thanks thank you danko uh, michael did you want to come in yeah, I just wanted to go back actually to something that you had said in your introduction, you mentioned uh, the new IP proposal. And there, there was kind of a, I guess, a clear and present danger that was presented in the, uh, and uh, along with a number of other people, the um, technical community responded. I think there was a paper from, from Olaf at ISOC, there was one from ICANN, I'm sure ITF was pushing back because it was, it was tangible and it was clearly a technical issue where the technical community could respond and, and discuss how, how this would impact the internet and, and fragment it uh, in, in some ways completely. But as David Fairchild mentioned, there may not be a zero draft um, that, that could be responded to. So we end up, as, as Peter said, talking about forensics. What was said by the tech envoy? Um, how was it said? Where did the technical community came up come up? And then the risk is that we end up kind of reacting too late when we when there's finally something on paper and and there's a, a risk to be discussed. So I, I think one thing that would be interesting is how, how do we come up with examples or, you know, Peter mentioned some, you know, where there's demands for regulation, where the technical community clearly can discuss the side effects. So one way I think to do it is to, to kind of look forward and talk about um, you know, the, the, the kinds of risks that could come up and how the technical community has been addressing them all along, as with many of the things the new IP was aimed at addressing, they were already being addressed at ITF and elsewhere. Um, so I think that's something that we should think about so we don't end up in February, March, April seeing the first draft and then in some ways it may be too late to react uh, when we can finally see some tangible threats. Thank you, Michael. Um, we can take one last question. Yeah, go ahead. And then we'll, we'll spend maybe just five minutes uh, going through concluding remarks from anyone who wants. Thank you. Um, first of all, really great to have the session at the IGF and really appreciate you putting this together. Um, it's a shame that not more people are there, but I, I see that it's being recorded, so hopefully more people can benefit from it. Um, I'm Eva Gantoshenko. I work in the UK government department for science, innovation and tech. And listening to this conversation, um, I'm sort of disappointed that we're making such a strong contrast between the technical community and the government as if those are two separate communities that somehow are antagonistic to each other. Um, I'm a firm believer working on digital technical standards. I have a team of technical experts um, that is very much uh, part of the technical community and is engaging actively in, in ICANN, in the IETF, in, in other technical bodies. Um, and 
for me, the really big question, and, and I'm wondering whether you can address that in the fin closing statements, is around the right mechanisms. Um, I definitely echo David's point on um, how many of you from the technical community are engaging with foreign ministries. And uh, UK foreign office is actually trying to get a lot more technical expertise into their missions, and they are bringing experts in. And I think this is a really great move. Same um, for us. We are trying to think about how we have a sustainable flow of talent into government that will never pay as well as the corporations do. Um, but when I looked at the GDC consultation, and there was an open process, I agree with the concerns. We, we are very concerned about multi stakeholder participation from here, but there was a chance to feed in. And the participation and the, and the contributions from private sector and from the technical community were very limited. We're very disappointed to see that because there was a chance to feed in. And I'm wondering whether that's because it was so high level that it was hard to see those technical problems that might come further down the line. But there needs to be a mechanism to allow for that engagement. And, and I do think we have a lot of good practice in the UK, how that's working. But what, how do we do that on a global level beyond sort of fora like this? And how do we speak the same language? That's what I found. We, we spend a lot of time teaching our policy experts to speak technical and our technical experts to speak policy. But it's not just a one-way street. Um, we're working in the IETF in particular to build that trust that governments are a stakeholder, as Constantine has pointed out. Um, and not see ourselves as enemies, but actually trying to achieve the same objectives um, and how can we kind of understand the means and, and where we might go wrong. Thank you. Thank you, Eva. Um, I think we can close here. Um, just perhaps to, on my side, just to, to, to rebound on what you, you've just said uh, and perhaps a point to, to Jean. I think uh, in your remarks, it sounded to me as if you, you were saying that uh, government needs to come to you, uh, and, and I, I, I fear that this is not a, this is not a. a that wasn't your point. Okay, <laughs> you can tell me afterwards. <laughs> All right. Do you want to say a few words to to conclude? Maybe Danko first. Uh, thank you. So first, thank you for these comments. I think true. Governments and have technical experts, and of course we have to work together. And I think this is a very good message. But for a conclusion, uh, thinking back about the fragmentation, I wanted also to, uh, I'm coming from, from Serbia. Uh, it's a small developing country uh, in Europe, not part of European Union. And in such a developing countries, the internet is the key to be part of the global world. And I think the risks of the fragmentation of internet are, are real. But the possible consequences of those risks are especially significant for developing countries because this is the having one internet for the one world is the way for a country to be part of that world, for people to, to export their services, to be part of the global workforce, to, to learn, to work, and you know, share culture. So I think uh, uh, this. Um, uh, this internet thing is actually kind of a world uh, peace project and we often discuss now possible negative consequences but we have to celebrate the successes of the internet and we have to protect it for the citizens of the world but also very much also for the developing uh, part of the world. Thank you. Thank you, Danko. Annelies, do you want to go next? Thanks, David. Um, I'd just like to thank you for your intervention. I think that's a really important point that you've made, um, and I do want to reiterate that we, you know, we shouldn't be seeing governments as the opposition, as the enemy. Um, you know, governments aren't just trying to stop everybody having a good time. They're, they're trying to protect their citizens, and that is that's the job of the government. Um, so, you know, I, I would like to just, you know, encourage the technical stakeholders in the room to, um, you know. I think we do need to have a coordinated response into some of these public policy processes that are happening. Um, and these conversations will be happening whether we engage with them or not. So I would like um, the technical stakeholders to sort of, you know, give some real consideration to what it is that we can contribute and to some coordination, uh, coordination amongst ourselves to provide that input to these processes. Thanks, David. Thank you, Annelies. Brenna? Thanks. Um, just about the comments on the process um, of the GDC, I do think it was rather open and it was welcome to have consultations and so on, but there were some problems along the way. Um, and, and speaking as, as part of like a group of CSOs that engaged um, on it from the very beginning, the first question we asked was, what will be the modalities? 
this is still an unanswered question, like two years after. Yeah, <laughs> and the whole like debate about the deep dives as well, right? Like when the deep, dive, deep, deep dives were cut up in half right at the end of it, um, not allowing any other stakeholder to speak for more than three minutes or only allowing the ones present in New York um, to speak o on those consultations, it kind of, kind of highlights that it's not a governmental problem, but it, it, it highlights the excluding side of the conversation, right? So that's, that's when we criticize all of those spaces and so on. And maybe my, my last remark about that is that w we need to do more things together, right? Like, so maybe now it's the moment for the technical community to advocate for more participation together with civil society and other stakeholders on this process that still lacks transparency, that still lacks defining a little better its scope and what will be the next step. So maybe it's, it's definitely time for collective action on that. So thanks a lot. Thank you, Bruno. Michael, do you want to say a few words on your side? Sure. Yeah, no, I just want to uh, kind of also second the idea of, uh, you know, the two-way engagement that's been mentioned a few times. And just maybe point out that the, you know, there's a long list of issues, not just avoiding uh, fragmentation of the internet, but there's a lot of other legitimate concerns of governments. And one of the incentives for, or one of the reasons that there's discussions of fragmentation and the kind that Bruna is talking about, not just technical, but other kinds is because of concerns about protecting citizens, um, uh, the, you know, the human rights issues and others. So maybe the way to engage is to engage on the other topics as well and show that the technical community is not just protecting its own uh, role, which is of course important and, and needs to be understood for developing an interoperable internet, but for helping to address some of the other issues on the list and, and having a proactive approach uh, rather than maybe a more defensive one. Thank you. Thank you, Michael, and thank you very much for getting up at 2 o'clock in the morning to be with us. It's much appreciated. Uh, thank you. I suggest we, we close it here. Thank you all so much for, for contributing and, 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 and for the discussion. And uh, don't hesitate to, I guess, interconnect after this session. <laughs> thank you. <laughs>